Hi, welcome to the uh, Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Monday, January 9th, 2023, just about 10 o'clock or a little bit after. We're starting off um, meeting today at 10. Future Mondays, we're looking at probably starting closer to noon, so members have time to spend with their budgets, uh, commissioners, and other things. This morning, I hear from JFO for uh, a little bit before the administration comes back at 1030, spot open, or I did, for um, opportunities that would present itself to give us a little room if we had committee discussion that we hadn't finished with. And, and um, the JFO is going to walk us through the, not the actual document of the BAA, but how this document is set up, what these funds are. Oh, my bad. And um, before we get started and call them in, I think Representative Harrison has something to say. Okay. Yes. Oh, you're about the BAA? Yes, you had something. Oh, yeah, I no, I, I, and I don't know how we're going to divide up the BAA, but there was a couple things that uh, last Friday that had to do with the Pay Act, which yeah, seemed um, was, odd. was my section of the budget um, because it had to do with human resources. So I did call the committee this morning, and the state police contract that is added in here, I think it was 1.7 yes. million maybe. Um, she did uh, uh, help me with my memory. We did include an amount in there last year for that contract, but the contract wasn't closed. Um, so it was their best guess estimate that they gave us to put in there for a number, and it turned out uh, for multiple reasons, uh, the contract ended up higher uh, than say the state employees as a, as, a, as a rule. And that amount that they're asking is the, um, is the uh, extra because of that contract. Uh, the other area uh, was corrections um, and a reference to the side agreement. We had the same, a similar, last year there was a side agreement uh, because of the difficulty of maintaining and staffing um, our correctional facilities. So um, they had to, um, they came up with an agreement, which you probably heard up about in the media with 12 hour shifts um, in fewer days. That um, uh, arrangement, new arrangement did cost, uh, does cost the state more money because they, part of the arrangement is they get overtime after eight hours on so those long shifts. So um, it's just uh, an unfortunate reality and corrections uh, we've heard multiple times that uh, staffing is very, very tight and it's not like you can let the work get behind you. You have to have staffing. Um, much like you have to answer the phone if you get a 911 call. So um, unlike other positions in government that things may go a little slower, you know, but uh, corrections you have to be staffed. So that is that is reflective of that new agreement, site agreement that they made uh, with, the, uh, with the committee. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that update and thank you for the <clears throat> to go and track that down as well. Um, are you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right. So um, with that, I think we can bring into the chair, Sarah. Welcome <clears throat> to Monday. Great, thank you. Good morning. You feel very far away, Madam Chair. <laughs> I feel it. We're gonna work on that spatial. <laughs> the record. I'm Sarah Clark. I'm the Deputy Fiscal Officer at the Joint Fiscal Office. We thought we had a pretty busy Friday afternoon. A lot of really great information came our way at the end of the day. So we thought we'd kick off today with just orienting everyone to the detailed spreadsheet workbook that Commissioner Gresham and his team presented to us on Friday. So if you have either uh, online or the papers that you received yesterday, I thought we'd use the one that Adam walked us through, which is a little bit of a higher level summary information. 
I thought I'd start the distinction between the two big spreadsheets that Commissioner Gresham provided. One is more summary level information in that it is at the appropriation level. The other spreadsheet provides each individual detailed change that rolls up to one appropriation. And so that distinction may be useful for you as you drill into some of those topics, wanting to see each of the individual changes to an appropriation. In addition, over the course of the next week or two, we'll have all of the departments come in and they will walk us all through in a much more detailed level the changes that are being proposed in the budget adjustment. So if I could direct everybody to the sheet that at the top, it's in a slightly smaller font. It says fiscal year 23 governor's recommended budget adjustment, which is the one that Commissioner Gresham walked us through last week. So please interrupt as you, as you have questions, but I'm just gonna orient you to the information that you see before you. And so at the start of the page, you'll see there's the black line that says as passed. And as you move across the columns of the sheet, you'll see dollar amounts. Uh, by fund source in each of the columns. Those dollar amounts reflect what the FY23 as passed base budget included um, by fund source. So as you move from left to right across the page, you'll see the columns correspond to a particular fund type. And I think this will be one of our um, presentations where we'll come in and talk a little bit more about the different fund types. Um, but for today, as we move across the page, you'll see general fund, transportation fund, education fund, special funds, and included in this bucket, there are several different special fund types, most notably <laughs> tobacco funds, fish and wildlife funds, and then there are, I think, roughly 300 different special fund types in state government that are all included in this bucket. Moving one more column over, you're going to see the Global Commitment Fund. This is the fund that is associated with a Medicaid program in Vermont. We are actually gonna have a presentation from Nolan Langwell in our office tomorrow that's going to give you basically a 101 of Global Commitment and Medicaid. It's a... Um, Relatively complex, but straightforward when you understand the financial mechanics surrounding the Global Commitment Fund and how it works in state government. And I'll let Nolan dive into some of those details, but I expect this will be an ongoing conversation that we have throughout the session. Moving across the page, there's also the Healthcare Resources Fund, which is a special fund that's pulled out on this sheet. It's also associated with the Medicaid program. Federal funds, which is one of our biggest funding sources in the state of Vermont, money from our federal partners. The next column over is dedicated funds, which are funds that are dedicated for a specific purpose. Um, they include things like the transportation infrastructure bond, enterprise funds, and there are some other funds included in that bucket that we'll talk more about. And then there's the other funds column, which that includes internal service funds, which is the funds that are associated essentially with the operations of state government. So it's like fee for space, what we pay to um, work in the buildings that we do. Um, also includes the human resources internal service fund, which departments and agencies pay to fund the operations of the human resource function. And those are just two examples. And there's also interdepartmental transfer funds included in this bucket. Interdepartmental transfer funds are when one department of state government pays another department of state government for something. And then you see the last number column is the total. So across all of those various different fund sources. And then what's very helpful on this summary sheet is the narrative description that describes using words, the changes that are being proposed in those lines. So we've talked, yes. I was just gonna say, so Sarah, if I was to look at that and I'd say, wait a minute, $9.6 billion, wait a minute, I thought the budget said it was 3.8. How is this different? Why is it there? What's different about that number? So th this number is going to include um, duplicated sources of funding. So what I mean by that is 
Um, for example, when one department of state government pays another, those funds are actually appropriated in two different places, even though it's for one essential expenditure. And so frequently what we do is we'll back out the duplicated sources of funding. And so that's why you'll see smaller totals. And though we talk about all fund sources, you know, we probably focus more on general fund, education fund, and federal funds. But this committee will get a chance to drill into all of them. Right. So the term, you'll hear the term, is that unduplicated or duplicated numbers? Is it global commitment? Is it what? So the, you'll hear that a lot is what is, you know, what, when something is unduplicated, they've taken it out. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, Representative. I presume that under federal funds, it includes both the standard general fund receive <clears throat> and we provide match for as well as the uh, the uh, co the uh, coronavirus federal related funds the cares act arpa funds so federal funds just includes the federal dollar not the state match associated with that that would be incorporated um, in this any one of these state fund lines, for example, in the general fund. So it would just include the federal funds. What I would want to do in this roughly $3 billion that they're including at the top, I would want to, they may not have included the um, American Rescue Plan Act state fiscal recovery fund dollars because that's, you know, those are more one time in nature. So they may not have included them in the base on this spreadsheet. Um, that's something that I would need to verify. But it's just the pure federal dollar. It's not any of the match in that column. So we have as a part of our uh, opportunity sinking is to have Doug Farnham come in sometime this week to walk us through, ooh, not my coffee, walk us through just the ARPA numbers. Is <clears throat> May I ask one another question? Uh, forgive me for my this elementary question. Uh, but when you talk about transfers between departments, is that a, um, do they need approval or through appropriations for an interdepartmental transfer that may be within the same agency? Um, they will need, always need spending authority, which equates to an appropriation. They need that authority in order to actually make the expense. Um, they try to, when an interdepartmental transfer is going to be part of the ongoing base budget or a base arrangement between two departments, even if they're within the same agency, they try to include it in their base budget. So we have the standard set for what those expenses are going to be every year. However, if in the course of a year, a new, let's say the health department receives a federal grant and uh, the Department for Children and Families is going to carry out a portion of that grant for them, they don't necessarily have to come through the appropriations process. There are other mechanisms where they can get the spending authority, the appropriation authority that they need in order to affect that agreement. That makes sense. Thank you. And can I just ask a follow-up question about, you mentioned, so the rental, um, you know, um, fees. So is that then, is that then reflected in BGS's yeah, so BGS, when they come and present their budget adjustment in their budget, they're going to say, you know, we need X amount of dollars to make our space program across state government. And then every department and agency will pay their share of fee for space for the buildings that they're in. There's a very detailed space book um, where they calculate what those charges are going to be every year to run the fee for space program. Yep. And so that's the exactly the duplication that we're talking about when we say duplicated versus unduplicated. Same thing for um, Agency of Digital Services, bills out to all of state government for their services. Sometimes you'll see when we when we start to see budgets come in, commissioners and secretaries will come in, and sometimes you'll see it a line item like you know, uh, fee for space, internal service, I, I, so or somebody may just roll it all up as internal service funds and not have broken them out by line. Okay. And one of the reasons it's helpful to spend some time understanding this form is that you're going to find as um, the FY24 budget is delivered that departments and agencies are required to use um, a format that's very similar to this. And so understanding the flow of this document is going to be useful throughout the session. 
um, right. called the crosswalk. You'll hear that term. I don't know if that's been a retired term or not. But well, I think we still use crosswalk. We also, when I was at the Agency of Human Services, we called it the ups and downs form. So uh, ups and downs. Um, so yeah, it's very useful. So. We'll learn about that one as we go to. Yep. And so to talk maybe about the rows on this sheet, um, Maria spent some time with you last week talking about the functional areas of state government and how the budget is designed. And so you'll see this is organized by functional area as you move down the rows. So you see first general government and so general government and then section B105 that refers to the section from the big bill where they're proposing to make the change. And you can see that's within the Agency of Digital Services, Communication and Information Technology Appropriation. And so as you move down this sheet, you're going to see um, the changes. Let's maybe skip down to protection because there's more than one change. So when you look at the protection function, you're going to see that there are multiple appropriations that are being adjusted. You can see what the section number of those appropriations are. So B209, B225, and you see what the, the name of that appropriation is. And then there is a subtotal, the total protection. So you can see the cumulative changes in that section that are being proposed by the governor in this budget adjustment. And again, this is a format that you're going to see not only in the administration documents that you get, but also the web report, which is you're perhaps familiar with that from just reviewing the budget and the changes um, in your <clears throat> role in former committees, or if you were um, at another agency in your previous life, you will be familiar with the web report. And that's where we detail all of the changes that this committee will make to the governor recommend and what the Senate will make, and then ultimately what the conference committee will agree to. And so it's a really useful document following the same structure to understand what's happening in the budget um, from an adjustment perspective. So I think I've hit the highlights. If you, you know, the first two pages on the sheet are the changes to what we would call like their base appropriations. These are all one-time changes. So it's important to understand that the Budget Adjustment Act itself are one-time changes that are happening in the year that we're in right now, fiscal year 23. However, some of these items may ultimately end up being base adjustments. And we will know that when we receive the FY24 governor recommend budget, because you will see some of those changes happening again in 24. Departments and agencies do try to note when they come in with their 24 budget proposals when an item also happened in budget adjustment. And that's helpful to understand because you will have already received some of that budget adjustment testimony. And so if it's just happening again in 24, meaning it's a change to their base, it'll be helpful for you to understand that this is something that you have seen before that you've reviewed, perhaps had a discussion. You may have additional questions when you look at it happening in the base, but it is something that was presented earlier. So when you go to the last page of this sheet, one time expenditures and other appropriation sections where the administration is proposing to use one time dollars appropriations in the budget adjustment for some specific purposes. We'll just talk briefly about the first one, and I'm looking at referring to section B1100 A24 where they are going to add a new one-time appropriation in the budget adjustment for $3 million um, to provide some American Rescue Plan Act rural capacity. Um, Commissioner Gresham spoke a little bit about this proposal last week in terms of providing resources to municipalities and towns to get the expertise they need to be able to perhaps apply for and administer these different programs. Um, yeah, I just, so, <clears throat> In the budget adjustment, are there, I mean, is it a mix of new requests, kind of new program plus redistribution, um, or is it, does it generally really focus on redistribution? That's a great question. I'm wondering like what our yeah. role is in that. So I'll, of course, you're, you're bipartisan, not the 
our JFO, I would say that that's a policy that we would typically try to say, or we try to stick to like just rebalancing. And, and there has been efforts in the past to say, you know, we're just going to stick to the readjusting and try not to do new programs. And, then, and of course, as soon as we say that, there'll be something that pops up that's like, well, if we don't get this out the door by, you know, by April, X won't happen, or there's some expedient reason mm -hmm. to have to do something now, mm -hmm. we're instead of waiting. And then we'll hear that. And then we get to be with the standing committees, because if it's a policy decision and the standing committee needs to weigh in on, on that, and they, uh, we may or may not agree, but it will be something that will be decided here and. I remember that yeah. from housing discussions. Right. Yeah. Okay, right. thanks. You're welcome. Oh, Representative Dolan. Uh, just a follow-up question. Yep, please. When, when I see these one-time ex expenditures, um, for these types of proposed appropriations. Is this new money that has come in during the course of this year, new revenues from our existing revenue sources and their proposal to target where those new revenues would go to? Or are they actually, as, as um, um, Rex and from Burlington pointed out, uh, a potential for repurposing or, or shifting dollars from one cash register to another. So I think when Commissioner Gresham was here on Friday, <coughs> are currently we have a surplus of general fund dollars as of the close of state fiscal year 22. And so that that balance that kind of falls to the bottom line, if you will, they are proposing to allocate some of those dollars, some of those dollars for these purposes. In addition, in July, when the emergency board met and adopted the revenue forecast, that was higher than what um, it was when the legislature adjourned last year. Um, so there are a variety of one time, if you will, general fund dollars. Now the emergency board is meeting again next Tuesday and they will um, reestablish that revenue forecast. Representative, Hi, I, I gotta get used to saying your last name, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Um, I just would love clarification on preferred committee practice on two issues. One is when a one-time appropriation relates to a bill that was passed last session, how do we handle that? And I'm thinking of, for example, sustainability planning. I think it was Act 167 for the hospitals which is related to some of the one-time requests here, mm -hmm. is the preference to treat it globally or do we acknowledge that because this budget was simultaneously passed, we don't look at Act 167, which was also passed in the same committee as my issue making, my question making I, sense? I think, yes, I'm sure your question is making sense, but I'm not, I don't know how to totally answer that right now. Okay. Is that okay? Yep, totally All fine. Right. And then, but the practice would be to, understand what the administration's desires are that they're bringing forward and blend that with our committees and, and we will to, decide if whether or not that made sense right and how to reconcile them with other statute related to how we plan in those sectors right. what yeah. was the legislative okay. intent right and then the second question is with respect to some of the reversions which relate to other pending policy proposals is the budget adjustment act the reason the right time to ask about those reversions, given that they relate also to other budget priorities, which have already sure. been communicated. Okay. Sure. Thank and you. Dickerson, did I get it right? No, Dickinson. Dickinson. I'll, I'll, Call me Lynn, Diane. I, no, I'm going to. I'll keep working. It's one of my one of my drawbacks is is the enunciation. So I will practice harder. Okay. Well, I have a question. Um, there was discussion that ARP money said during the joint fiscal hearing that it's all been obligated. Mm -hmm. So it should be somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it isn't really one time, I mean, it's one time money that's been obligated. Yep. We have these things added here. Some of it may be ARPA. There was discussion along the way previous to this that ARPA money that was not spent for specific purposes would be pulled back, clawed back, and maybe reapportioned mm -hmm. to something else. Mm -hmm. Is that what this money is, or is this all? This is all right here, which you were pointing at is. Maybe I can help, maybe. And, and I'm going to see if I'm right too. So this is one of the, th when you saw the words ARPA rural capacity, yeah. there's a sense that, oh, that's ARPA dollars. It is not. 
to see where it is. It's $3 million of general fund okay. that is saying what their intent is saying. Listen, we have this excess capacity of carry forward one time dollars, and we might want to help the municipalities be able to access their ARPA. So it's not using ARPA money, but it's helping general fund to help municipalities maybe writing the grants or the rural capacity so that they don't leave money, ARPA money on the table. Right, I see it. That, now I see how those explain. Yeah, okay, good. All right, um, we are right at 1030. We had a initial walkthrough. Was this helpful? Yeah. Okay, good, it's helpful for me too, because it's been a while. So. Thank you, sir. And then this afternoon, we'll have even more and more um, what we're calling some more orientation. And to tell you the truth, I, uh, we, we worked it up, but I haven't even looked at it yet, but I know it's gonna be great. <coughs> Commissioner, do you need a moment or would you like to step forward or it's gonna be you and your team? We're ready when you are. All right, are we doing language? We are doing language. No, what's the help? Oh, let's see. Yeah, it would be okay. a long time if we waited to have to go back. So <clears throat> after a while, and then okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Checking process. I wear my glasses, Commissioner. I can see you, I can people clearly, but I can't read the words. I'm working on like this du duality. So, so sometimes I'll see you and sometimes I won't. But I'm gonna let go and make sure that I can see the commission. Priority. To make I'll let you know when I'm no longer here. <laughs> okay, all right. So does everybody have, um, this is what we're gonna go through. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just point out that Representative Shy is on Zoom. She's had her cold, and and thanks to technology, she's able to zoom in. So, Representative Shy, if you have a question, or when you have a question, I should say, uh, just uh, chime in. Or if I don't see you, just uh, speak up, okay? Or I'll try to keep an eye uh, for your hand, but I may miss it. Thank you. You're welcome. What did you say? <laughs> she's, she's a total laryngitis, which I have to say my family wishes sometimes I had. But, <laughs> all right, Commissioner, let's walk through. Morning, everyone. Morning. So when we submit our budget adjustment, there's a big uh, um, Excel spreadsheet that we go over with all the numbers and the accompanying document is a language document that explains anything that requires explanation. So you have uh, in front of you our language document and I thought that uh, my colleague Hardy Merrill and I would go through it um, and answer any questions that we can uh, and certainly uh, tee up any questions for our uh, departments and agencies of jurisdiction to the extent that we can't answer. So, um, taking it from the top, um, there is uh, a number of additional one-time appropriations uh, that we are adding to. Section B1100 in the big bill is for one-time appropriations. And you'll note here that we add numbers uh, 24 to 30. So there'll be, uh, instead of 23 one-time appropriations in the big bill, there'll be 30 uh, as proposed by the governor. The first of which uh, is, uh, as I believe you were speaking about earlier, uh, $3 million is directed to the Secretary of Administration for the Rural uh, Infrastructure Assistance Program. Uh, there is further descriptive language later in the document where we relate uh, the specifics of how that money will be used or how it's envisioned to be used. 
Um, so uh, we will get to that. And this is just the appropriation. Uh, the similarly uh, number 25 uh, is uh, 3.345 to the secretary. This is to be used as a uh, 10% state match for FEMA uh, COVID funds and recall that it, FEMA reimbursed uh, COVID expenses uh, incurred by the states at 100% through uh, June 30th of 2022. July 1 of 2022 and uh, time forward, there is a 10% state match requirement. So this is our best estimate of state match expenses. Representative Harris, I have a question and then Representative Bloomley. Yeah, Commissioner, just refresh with you. Did we not know of that change when we did the budget last year? Uh, we were not certain that it would be a requirement. Thank you. Representative Bloomley? I actually have the same question. Okay. <laughs> so um, the next on the, uh, actually, dump in the next on the list. Sure. Thank you, Adam. And uh, Madam Chair, you'll note that I have the same optical challenges, I think, as yourself. So I'm balancing my uh, glasses on my forehead. Um, so the next one-time general fund appropriation is for $1.734 million to the Agency of Digital Services be used as state match for USGS LIDAR grant. Um, the amount being matched by USGS is $1.15 million. There are also private entities contributing to the effort. Uh, project total is uh, estimated at $3.8 million. And as noted in the explanation, these grant funds are available uh, approximately every eight years. And um, the uh, uh, agency is interested in taking advantage of this opportunity via BAA. It is uh, critical to execute the project prior to leaf out uh, in the springtime, hence in BAA as opposed to so, so thank you. I'm just going to stop only because we're we're also in a learning curve here too. So every now and then I may jump in for that. So this might be one of those items that said, oh, when would it be of urgency? And he indicated they really would like this now because it's best to be able to get the um, the light. You know what the lidar is? That's the uh, filming. Okay, before the leaves come out on the trees, so that they get the best view. So that's their explanation of why it should be done that there's a ur sense of urgency around it versus waiting to the 24. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> and uh, the next item, uh, subsection 27, the 1.115 million to the military department to be the state match for the federal SRM funds eligible for receipt in federal fiscal year 23. And as noted in the explanatory notes, um, near the end of last session, the C section of Act 185 was amended to provide 1.68 million of state match for 5.182 million that was uh, that became available for use in federal fiscal year 22, uh, ending November. So this is it was expected at that time and. Uh, I believe explained to the committee that the federal fiscal year 23 match requirement would be coming in in BAA. So here it is. Help the people at home when you say the acronym that SRM. And if anybody wants to follow along with this, the actual uh, governor's recommended budget adjustment language is on our web page. So you can go and pull that up. I know there's hundreds of people watching at home. Yep. Oh, and Oh, sure. Did you want me to spell out the do that first and then representative shy? OK, um, so the federal facilities sustainment <laughs> restoration and modernization funds is the uh, uh, is what the acronym stands for. Thank you. And we'll we will have to take testimony from them or from is a little bit deeper. But OK, representative shy, you have a question, ma'am? Thank you. Um, is this usually in the capital bill? Because I remember doing stuff for the armories in the capital bill in past years. 
Um, so I'm aware of, uh, you know, work, capital work being in the capital bill uh, for armory work. I'm not sure whether specifically uh, state match funds for specific federal uh, SRM uh, available funds has been in the capital bill prior. Thank you. I think typically it is not. Typically we do match funds to a general fund. Whereas capital bill is typically project related, that it, but that's probably a better question. That we'll, we'll follow up with you on that, Representative Shaw. I, I do know that you'll be able to hear when Terry provides testimony about the fact that uh, these per, this particular funding tranche allows them to do things that uh, they typically have not been able to do with the typical capital appropriations, which has been more really keeping the you know the roof from leaking and that sort of and that sort of thing <laughs> in uh, the sort of, of capital bill asks, and that this funding allows them to really uh, it it's more uh, in, it, moving forward in terms of more dramatic improvements. Was my understanding from talking to them last year? It's been a while, but. Thank you. Um, I'll turn the page and also cover uh, item subsection 28, 30 million dollars to the public service department to be used as state match for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration NTIA broadband grant. This is a, uh, as the committee's probably aware, there were, were um, Certainly a great deal of ARPA funds for the, the broadband expansion um, that have already been realized and appropriated. This is uh, in addition to the funds already coming to the state. This represents an application for a competitive grant for additional funds on top that are um, provided through a, a granting program. Uh, also created, I believe, in the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the 30 million represents the state match required toward a project that is estimated at $114 million in total. The application has already been submitted uh, as of September 30th, 22, and uh, we're expected to uh, uh, according to the application, we would pull down 67 uh, about sixty-seven and a half million dollars from uh, in federal funds, based on this. There are also some in-kind matches being provided by three uh, private uh, institutions engaged in the in the fiber optic network communications industry. Just a, a quick question, and then Representative Harrison, when you said ARPA, that I thought it was maybe the uh, IIJA, f the broadband part of it. I, well, I, don't, I don't know if there was ARPA grants <clears throat> or maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm just um, getting a couple. I could follow up with more detail if you'd like on the breakdown of amounts. So that I heard that, heard um, that right. From different, I, I did intend to use the word ARPA and my recollection is that there were uh, grant ARPA, opportunities. ARPA funds specifically for broadband and there may be in IIJA as yeah. well, and I can provide more of a breakdown if it's like, but. Okay, I'm sure we'll get there. Representative Harrison and then Representative- yeah, same, same area. I do, we had put, I think, what, 250 million of the ARPA funds aside for broadband. Yeah. <clears throat> and then additionally, uh, I think yeah. uh, it was projected we were gonna get 100 million from the infrastructure bill. Yes. This is- This is completely in addition and on top of Okay. Right. Maybe it'll make it a lazy acre. And and so this is not automatic. It is a it is a competitive grant. Yep. And actually, um, I my, it's my understanding that most of the grant applic applicants are actually not states, uh, but even private entities. And um, it will be. I, I would recommend the, the, that the committee take more testimony, you know, from the public service department to get more specifics. But this is completely on top of everything else envisioned already. Yep. Thank you. That was good to understand. Representative Holcomb, then Representative Dahl. I'll hold my question until we hear the testimony from PSD. Okay. 
And, and perhaps this question should be um, reserved as well for future testimony, but interested to know whether the, uh, the other funding uh, sources is reflecting where the intent of these dollars would go, or would they be specific to these regional um, locations where these uh, in-kind sources operate, or would it be provided more on a statewide basis? I would I would encourage uh, the answer to that question come from okay. public, public service department. Yeah. Um, moving to the next item, uh, there's uh, this is the uh, appropriation to the state refugee resettlement office. Um, there is language further on in uh, this document that describes the specifics of how we intend that to be used. Um, but what I would say is that this is to provide um, uh, assessment for communities, to help communities assess whether they are capable of receiving uh, refugee resettlement, um, as well as provide resources for various wraparound services, employment support, transportation, and the like. Um, so, you know, this, uh, and I believe the question came up last time or last week. You know, this is not intended to go directly to refugees, but it's intended to go to them as well as organizations that will service them. Um, you'll see, uh, as I said, a little further on in the document, descriptive um, verbiage that. And the next item is. Um, 9.225 million to DMH. Um, and this is to continue and to, uh, the hope is to complete construction um, on a uh, inpatient youth facility uh, or uh, down at Southwestern Vermont um, Medical Center. Uh, the intent uh, is to provide these funds uh, so that the uh, construction and the build out can happen quickly. And the hope uh, is, and the expectation actually is that uh, these beds will be online by January 1 of 2024. Why there's been, um, this was presented in the budget adjustment. Uh, as I said earlier, they have a facility, they're not building a new building, but they're retrofitting uh, a space within an existing building. Um, and these, anyway, the, so uh, that is in the budget adjustment to try to keep the momentum going. Thank you, Commissioner. We have two questions, Representative Shai and Representative Holcomb. Uh, thank you. Um, I contacted a friend who's on the Green Mountain Care Board who had not heard of this at all. Their staff just had and they did think a certificate of need was probably likely, although that wasn't the final uh, say at that point, they're looking into it. So that could be a concern in terms of getting it out by January. Uh, I also know that there's urgency and as I understand it, this is in response to the fact that UVM Medical Center couldn't, uh, didn't have the funds to put in extra beds at Central Vermont, I believe, is that right? That's correct. No, I think it's the con is the big deal that we'll find out about from other people if you don't know about that. I don't know. A certificate of need would, uh, I'm sure that uh, the department uh, <coughs> speak to that particularly. But uh, I can answer affirmatively that this was um, in, in part or in large part an answer to the fact that the build out did not happen at UVM. Uh, there is a great need. Um, mm -hmm. And keep in mind, these are supposed to be complementary to the retreat, to Brattleboro retreat. Um, these are um, for youth from 12 to 18 years old um, who quite possibly presented at the retreat and were not accepted or, were, you know, were not accepted for um, residents. So, you know, th these are... Uh, children um, Bless you. in need, and this facility is designed for that to be for those people. So, you know, we know there's a need. We don't have the capability right now. Um, so, 
I think we appreciate we appreciate your experience with it, but I think yeah, we'll have to find out if it's what's possible or if there's anything in the way. Repres yeah, just can I just follow up on mm -hmm. yeah? So um, my understanding in part is that uh, when there's kind of co-occurring medical needs, that that isn't a good fit for the retreat in terms of what they have on campus. So that that was one of the holds. Uh, so it wasn't that they like certain certain patients may or may not be an appropriate uh, medical fit with what their capacity is. And so I believe with it being at <laughs> Southwest Vermont Medical Center, that the young people who have this sort of co-occurring conditions will be able to be, have all of their needs met in a way that the retreat can't meet. So that there is a differentiation of practice. Thank you, sir. Uh, Representative Page. Uh, yes, if <clears throat> go back to the refugee resettlement issue, and I had read um, where the focus is on four four uh, communities. That's correct, Vermont. Uh, there are other communities within Vermont, and I, I was just curious: will there be more funds coming forward to them, or is this just is this specifically just for those four communities? I think the language reads with a focus on, um, actually, you can see it later on, I forget how they put it, but um, I think the representative page is referring to Pittenden, um, Rutland, Pittenden, and Brattleboro. Brattleboro. Um, and I think the focus is on those communities, but I don't think the intent is to be exclusively for those communities. I think the initial focus will be on that. And why they chose those communities, I think that would be a better question for the refugee resettlement office. I don't know the specifics. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Representative, welcome. Go ahead. Well, since we went back to refugees, I have a question about that too. Is when you bid, is there, um, well, what's your understanding of how these dollars will be applied? Some of these services are pretty specialized. Is the intent to build on existing state capabilities, for example, through the adult education network, or is this? Is there a vision for how this will be? So this is a grant program. Mm -hmm. um, so organizations or communities will apply for these funds to do various things, um, find out whether they have the capability or whether they have the infrastructure to handle refugees. That's really the first and probably foremost. Um, but then secondarily, there are organizations <laughs> within those communities that will apply for grants to help with various wraparound services, housing, employment, and the like. But they will be applications. The Refugee Resettlement Office will then <laughs> determine what the most appropriate use of those funds are. So it's a granting. And, and then Representative Torino. And, and then to go back to the health, uh, the Southern Vermont system, I know that last year the legislature passed Act 167 around sustainability planning, and I'm just curious, we, we agree that there's a critical shortage. Was this proposal developed in consultation with that process? And I noticed that this is relevant because Battle Grill comes up as well at a different way. Can't answer that. Um, I'm sorry. Don't know. Can I just tell you how proud I am of the members that are in this room? Because they know this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Representative Torino. Just a comment on the refugee piece, uh, because Brattleboro is named, and and I know a little bit more about what we we've, we've gone through a very rapid uh, standing up of a, of a local refugee resettlement program. Um, there is, of course, a, a partner ECTC that is sort of the day to day, but several of the community organizations that wouldn't normally have this as their primary responsibility have dedicated significant staff time to it. This grant program, they may or may not be eligible. I'm gonna look into the details to try to understand it, but I think based on what I'm seeing and hearing from my community with 100 or so individual families come, coming in very short order, it, it required a, a significant community-wide effort and this is, I think, speaking to the need to be able to regrant and support some of those organizations for whom it wasn't their primary mission. Representative Page? Yes, I'll, I'll just say um, my humble opinion, sir, uh, $350,000 for the four communities seems to be, to me, a little 
little less than it probably should be, but that's just my opinion, sir. Yeah. Understood. We're trying to balance what we have available, what the need is. Um, but with so many refugees coming in, and, and we would like more, too. It just seems woefully inadequate, sir. Noted. Senator Dillon? I appreciate the focus on providing the wraparound services. In terms of capacity, I know that we have in-state contracts for oral interpretation services, but we outsource all written translation services. And in terms of providing a sustainable long-term uh, wraparound service with language support, I would um, be very interested in seeing what we can enhance our in-state language service that can provide written translation as well. I just wanted to make a note of it. I see the future. Did I get it right? You got it right. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on that because um, I know that it, that um, Office of Racial Equity has done a kind of a um, assessment of the state's ability to provide kind of critical information um, to um, folks who speak different languages and. Um, and, you know, it, it's very uneven across departments. And so um, I, I think that the point that you raised about the $350,000, I, 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 I welcome that discussion <laughs> when it comes. <clears throat> You're at the table. Not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but that may well come up shortly. Okay. <laughs> we'll keep going through. Okay, moving on to the appropriation of subsection 31, which is $3 million to the Department of Children and Families Office of Economic Opportunity for the CARES housing voucher program. And my understanding of this appropriation is to provide general fund dollars to a housing voucher program that is administered by a contractor and has previously been funded by federal funds provided by the CARES Act, uh, which have uh, which have dried up. And uh, AHS and DCF are very interested in providing a temporary bridge of continued funding to service clients that have made use of this program. My understanding uh, is that they uh, they proposed it as a one-time appropriation intentionally and not as an ongoing uh, base budget item forever, but that they do see a need in particular as there are delays in uh, new housing stock coming online and as well in uh, the timing of the uh, issuance of Section 8 housing vouchers. That this is a bridge program uh, for certain families in need to, to bridge them to a more permanent housing voucher uh, like federal Section 8. I can't, I, I, I'll, I'm happy to take questions, although I can't speak in much more detail authoritatively on the nature of the program. And um, I think DCF would be best positioned to provide more detail, but I'll pause there for a moment. Thank you, Representative Harrison. Yeah, just um, clarification. When you say housing voucher program, is that the same as the hotel voucher program, or are we talking about something else with actual rental assistance? Uh, my uh, uh, my uh, understanding, well, uh, well, not complete, is uh, this is more of a rental housing voucher. I, I don't and I don't believe this is associated with. Uh, hotel motel voucher program, which is really an emergency housing, and that this is uh, and that this is not an emergency housing situation, but it's to provide a support for. Uh, yeah, I can be a, just a tiny bit more. It, these are people coming out of the hotel motel voucher programs, you know. So this is a transitional program that was stood up to get these people into. Housing, ideally, uh, federal uh, programs okay. that will be able to provide subsidies for them, um, and it was set up under the CARES Act. 
um, but it was federally funded. Uh, but these are for people moving beyond the kind of the, the hotel motel voucher program into rental. Thank you. All set? I'll continue on to subsection 32, five million dollars to the Department of Housing and Community Development as additional support for Vermont Housing Improvement Program. Um, so this, this is really uh, a request for additional funds into an existing program that has been uh, apparently successful and oversubscribed. Uh, so I would note that this is in addition to $5 million of ARPA funds uh, that were provided in section G400 of Act 185. And it's also less obvious, uh, what we note is that this is also uh, in addition to $1 million of general fund uh, base budget that was provided in FY23 as well. So this is on top of? This is on top of, and this is not proposing any changes to the program design or structure or how it operates, but it's more funds to do more of the same work. Did I hear you say that it was all expended, that that five and the one, so the six million is in? Uh, I, 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 actually, I could not confirm whether it's been expended as of this date. I think it is expected to be expended and hence its uh, inclusion in BAA, that more funds could be needed in the time frame of a, of a BAA enactment. Okay, great. We'll get more details on that. Did anybody else have any? Uh, on the next page, I'm now on page three, uh, we're uh, adding a new section to Act 185. Act 185 did not contain um, any one-time special fund appropriations. Typical convention uh, in the big bill language is that B1100 section is used for general fund uh, one-time appropriations and then other section numbers are added subsequent to the 1100 number uh, to provide for one-time appropriations from other funds. So this is adding a section B1101 for fiscal year 2023 one-time environmental contingency fund appropriations. So this appropriation is uh, it, uh, depends upon also within the Budget Adjustment Act as recommended by the governor uh, to make a $3 million transfer from the general fund to the environmental contingency fund. And then that would then create the ability for this one time environmental contingency fund appropriation to be made. And the purpose for the appropriation is as stated in the language um, uh, to the Department of Environmental Conservation for uh, PFAS remediation. And uh, you probably appreciate it if I could spell out the what the acronym <laughs> stands for. We won't test either one of our ability to enunciate that. There may be somebody here who can, though. Representative Dolan, I'm sure that this is. Stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. It's, I welcome having a subject matter expert. <laughs> it's so nice, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. If I may, though, I, I, I do worry about the, again, the sustainability of the, of the environmental contingency fund. It's, it appears that every year we need to keep adding money into that fund and look forward to a conversation about how we can really sustain that fund over time, knowing that some of these contaminations that we see, whether it's PFAS or other type of spill related contamination, it seems to be ongoing and uh, and this fund and it's critical for enabling the state to restore those sites. Thank you, Representative Dolan. I'll, I'll also add the one other note uh, that doesn't appear here that I am aware of from uh, communicating with the natural resources on this request is that um, initially it was proposed as a general fund appropriation and then it was subsequently determined that it was advantageous 
to uh, employ this structure of transfer into the ECF mm -hmm. and then uh, appropriation from the ECF because it it uh, they could speak better to the particular details, but there were some technical reasons for that. Um, having to do with statutory um, uh, aspects, I believe, pertain mm -hmm. to the environmental contingency fund. You're right on that. That needs to have something that triggers it. We need to put money into it. Just a process question. In a case like this, um, where we're setting up basically a sinking fund, is it also expected that there would be language coming forward to prevent the continuing infusion? I th the environment. think we'll hear, and if mm -hmm. I'm like reaching way back in my memory too, that there is something about that there needs to be the reason for the transfer to happen, mm -hmm. right? Am I getting that right or close? And it's okay if you say, no, ma'am, you have that totally wrong. I, I think I, uh, on this, I can't affirmatively support or contradict uh, the, chair's, uh, the chair's statement. I think we'll hear more about this from ANR, the, the next level of, of, of detail around your concerns around the sustainability of the fund having dollars versus it's just like, you know, we, we hope we don't have any FEMA disasters, but, you know, it's tough to tie up dollars in there for the year when nothing happens. So you, you keep, you keep that open and you put a million dollars in it or something to be ready. And then if you watch, if you need to make the adjustment to add to it. Am I that, uh, that, I, that does, uh, uh, those statements make sense to me and my understanding of, of how the fund has been handled. Yes, it, it is not like many, many funds are, are, there's an effort made to set them up with a yes. sustainable source of revenue. And this one has not been like that. And it's been, we put money in when it's needed to respond to particular events. I think the, the world now is at a place where Hmm. This isn't a one-off that's once every five or eight years. So there's a concern that when there is something that happens, how are we building in the resilience of our ability to respond to it? Because we know now that whether it's climate issues or other things, the variety of flooding that you can look at the trends going, this might need to have some more, um, like this sustainability within that program. We worry that there'll come a day when we're not able to, that something will happen and we're, well, some days we're, we're like that every day, aren't we? All right, sorry to trail off. Representative Bloomley. Um, when we talk about PFAS, then I'm reminded of PCBs, um, which I actually got totally jumbled in my head on Friday. I'm wondering, I'm not recalling anything from these spreadsheets or the, the, the narrative here um, uh, about PCB mitigation. And I know that we appropriated, I can't remember the actual, it's 32 million or um, for PCB remediation, but there's there's nothing in the budget adjustment that about that, right? They're not asking right. more they're and they're not asking, asking and, they are, and they're not saying, oh, we don't need this here, you right. can have it back. So there was 10 million that was appropriated in from the education fund and then um, another or maybe 12 million and then another 20 million of so-called waterfall money to the extent that the education fund had it available at the end of the year and they did so there's a total of 32 million dollars in pcbs 2.5 of which uh was um loosened by the um joint fiscal committee to start with um, mitigation efforts, but the body of it, let's say $30 million is available. Um, and so uh, that is for use um, by ANR, Department of Health and AOE um, to use. But there's nothing in, in this budget adjustment. That mm -hmm. you that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. The next section adds another new section, section B1102, for the purpose of making an another uh, set of one-time appropriations from a special fund. In this case, the fund in question being the Technology Modernization Special Fund. And uh, to recap our testimony that was provided when we reviewed the worksheet, uh, 
the first four uh, appropriations, so subsections A through D, um, apply to $16.76 million that was actually first appropriated in section B105. So in the Agency of Digital Services base budget, that is where the appropriation for these items was made uh, with the passage of the big bill. This is a change to move. Uh, we, we reduced, as you can see on the worksheet presented on Friday, the base uh, appropriation in the Technology Modern Modernization Special Fund for ADS by $16.76 million. And we're adding it as one-time appropriations. And this was really uh, in the opinion of both the Joint Fiscal Office and the administration, a more appropriate way to handle these appropriations. And uh, to those four appropriations, we are also making two more. These appropriations had not been made with the passage of Act 185. They, uh, the funds to fund these two appropriations were made available as part of contingent transfers uh, dependent on surplus revenue being available yeah. at the end of FY22. That revenue was in fact available. It was actually an amount of $50.25 million uh, to provide for these two projects. It was transferred from the general fund to the tech modernization fund at the closeout of FY 2022. This is now taking the action of making an appropriation for these funds. This is, uh, I believe was the need for these to be identified as appropriations was I believe identified in the legislative intent letter. And uh, I guess the only other significant thing I would note is that, well, the entire uh, project amount of 20.25 million is being appropriated for the DMV core system modernization phase two project. At this time, only 3 million out of a total of 30 million uh, anticipated project cost and 30 million that was transferred to the fund for this purpose. Only 3 million is being appropriated for use in FY uh, 23. And that is to be consistent with section E105.2 subsection C2A language in Act 185 that uh, it specifies clearly only this only this amount uh, is intended for release in fiscal 23. So, do you have your hand up? I'm, I'm sensing a I'm, question. I just need clarification. I'm a little slow. Sure. Trying to figure out this explanation here. If you're removing this from the base appropriation, yes. On time appropriation, yes. Maintaining the base appropriation, does that leave ADS with the 16? million but no. allocated no what if you look at what you'll uh, it's perhaps most illustrative to, to look back at if you look at the worksheet that was presented on friday what you'll see in b105 the very first line of the spreadsheet is in red a number with parentheses around it uh, i see i'm good which is 16 which shows the 16 um 709, which actually there, there's actually a combination, as you'll see in the sidebar, of a reduction of 16.76 and also for a technical correction, an increase of 51,000 taking place in that column. But that it is definitely being reduced, added as one time, and that's what's happened. Thank you. Excellent question, though. Representative Dick. Dick yeah, Dick. thank you. Um, under E, if you're taking only you've got 20.25 million, but only three millions out of a total 30 million that's being appropriated. Uh, okay, so why aren't you spending more if you're three million? What's the logic behind all? Okay, so well, the 20.25 million we are appropriating the entire amount mm -hmm. um, in. Uh, section in subsection E. The entire amount that was transferred is being appropriated in this year and it will the appropriation will probably remain and be carried forward past the end of fiscal 23. This is a major project. 
however, um, it's subsection F that has something unusual, go more unusual going on, which is the legislature did not wish to make the entire $30 million available in FY23. And if you um, consult the language in section E105.2 of Act 185, you'll see there's an intent to really build some fences around that. And uh, I, I believe the language will show an intent to see plan plans and approved plans for releasing more funds to go to go forward. And yeah, it wasn't ready yet, but, but we're willing to put some chips on the table to go forward with it. Software. Right. But the DMV piece is a, this is the second year. This is DM this this would this would complete what they need for that project, correct? They've already yes. Yeah. They've already had the 20. This is the other I, I'm not sure if phase two will absolutely complete it, but it's a continuation of the right. phase one. And so it's something already underway and keep it going. And whereas uh, the DOL, the, the UI modernization is a completely new right. project that's starting and awesome. legislative intent to fence the amount that's provided in the first year and provide incremental amounts. Be yes, Thank you. Okay. Um, you done? Yes, sir. So in the next section, uh, the D section of the big bill is typically where we put transfers. Uh, and so you'll see that there are a number of uh, entries there. The first of which is a transfer to the uh, ERAF fund, Emergency Relief and Assistance Fund. Uh, we transfer money in there every year. Uh, we typically, if we have available revenue, we'll do it in the budget adjustment just to, you know, kind of get it out of the way for the big bill, but there's no reason why we have to do it then, except we do know that uh, we have $2.1 million of need state match for FEMA reimbursements for FY23 and FY24. Those are known uh, match requirements. Did you say uh, FY2? Unknown, but we know now that we'll need at least uh, 2.1 million to meet our FEMA match requirements. So we're transferring that into the uh, ERAF fund. Uh, the next transfer is, as we've discussed, uh, the three million dollars to the environment uh, from the Environmental Contingency Fund for fast remediation. Uh, we have to put the money in the fund first, and so this is the transfer into the fund. And then um, there is also a uh, little more than a half a million dollars into the uh, Cannabis Regulation Fund to meet a uh, compilation of operating expenses. Uh, you know. Uh, it will happen in FY23 or through, you know, the next six months. I know that's Representative Shai's area of depth. Do you have a question around that right now or are you good? Okay. <clears throat> uh, there's also uh, what I would term kind of clean up a little below uh, transferring small amounts uh, in uh, the Agency of Human Services, various special funds back to the general fund. You'll see that um, at the bottom of the page. On the uh, next page, five of 22, there uh, is, that is where we are um, reverting to the general fund, various carry forward amounts from the departments that you see. Uh, we do that in budget adjustment and the, the total reversion amount will be ten and a half million dollars. And we arrive at that number by the numbers you see laid out in front of you. Totally just have a question because the first two are not underlined and the others are because they're new. I mean, well, help me. Those were in, those were already. They were already. Anticipated. Okay. They, they were made. The underline are the new, the end. Okay. Yep. Yep. Those were made in Act 185. I guess I would note that, uh, uh, all it being a similar case last year that more than half the total amount of reversions are made up by reversions in from uh, homeowner rebates and from renter rebates and uh, 
I know there was a large amount of rent or rebates specifically last year as well, moving back to the general fund. So that's that's more than uh, that's more than half of it. And then there's another 1.376 million uh, reverted from a one-time appropriation uh, in AHS that uh, from which there was no expenditure in uh, fiscal 22. Just one technical note I'll also make is that you can, uh, some inside baseball where you see the, uh, the depth ID numbers, which are mm -hmm. the long numbers preceding the, uh, uh, the description. If you see eight, the numbers, the digits 89 in the middle, that indicates a one-time appropriation as opposed to a base appropriation. And, and so commonly, uh, you know, departments will submit for reversion amounts that are left in one-time uh, appropriations for which the, you know, the project uh, or use has already been complete. Um, and then in, at other times, there are amounts left in base budget um, debt IDs where, uh, you know, there's a surplus that's not needed for another purpose. So combination of factors, but, Again, highlighting that the two largest um, accounts are, uh, again, homeowner rebates and renter rebates. Um, so I've just got a question myself around the food bank at, at 1.3. It just doesn't, you know, when we talk to the public, which is also us, you know, when it doesn't jive when there's so much food insecurity and, and drives for it and then they getting this right. It was a one time because it has 89 in the middle of it. So they had gotten a one time <clears throat> appropriation, which was I'm going to assume was much larger than the number we see here at the end of the time frame. <clears throat> this was not able to be used and it's being reverted back. Right. Well, all I can state on this is that it was, in fact, uh, recommended for reversion mm -hmm. by AHS to finance and management. When we receive a, re a department recommending that their funds be reverted from a particular appropriation, we typically don't argue. <laughs> but I don't have any additional uh, information, you know, as to whether what, there was a federal fund source that made this not needed. That would be a question, you know, for AHS on this because we we didn't go. If I was on your side of the table, I wouldn't argue either. But our side of the table, we're going to maybe want to know why. <laughs> Representative Harrison, did you? I've got a sense that you had a question or no? Okay. All right. So, does this seem like a typical? It just seems bigger that there's more reversions here than than normal. So, our or normal is anymore. I mean, the eye popping number actually was the amount of requested carry forward, which was truly was over half a billion dollars of total requesting carry forward which you might think is extraordinary being that our budget is two billion so that's a quarter of the budget being asked however that represented a, to to hardy's comment a lot of that was one-time money that you know keep in mind some of these programs the budget passes in may the fiscal year ends in the end of june so in many cases they just haven't got the money out the door uh, particularly one-time appropriations that they may or may not have anticipated. So that was unusual. But, you know, having said that, I'll say there, there was, I don't know, I think a little over $200 million of kind of base spending carry forward. Um, and a, a good amount of that was the fact that um, we have a fair number of vacancies. And you have a fair number of what? I'm sorry. Vacancies. Oh, vacancies. Yep. And there's a fair amount of payroll that is budgeted for that is not being paid out. Mm -hmm. um, that is very unusual. Um, so, you know, um, I would also add that many times departments have a lot of needs that are not met in their base budgets because we don't have the funds and we try as best we can. And so these funds are put right to work. Um, we typically do not revert funds from departments unless you know, it really is less we're requested to as sometimes we are. Yeah. Um, but, you know, many times the funds stay with the department and they're used for one time expenses that normally wouldn't be funded. 
Right. But you're right. I mean, ten and a half. But in future, you're going to fill that position, and now we don't need to have to have to break that into the budget. That's correct. It's already in their base. Yeah. I, Representative Dolan, Representative Holcomb. I appreciate that. Um, the realities of, especially during a time where we received a significant amount of federal dollars and the capacity of the state to get those dollars out, I, um, perhaps was quite a challenge across all agencies. I, I do worry about the, the vacancies, though, whether they're left vacant, you know, as vacancy savings, or are they vacancies uh, uh, not being able to hire fast enough or finding, you know, workforce challenges as well. and. So those are just sort of a general concern I have um, that may result in why we're, we have such a special amount of um, carry forward requests, the vacancy savings pressures. I guess, well, what I would, I think I would respond that if uh, vacancy savings is being budgeted and if perhaps uh, vacancies being held on purpose, you know, and not being hired, it's be, and because it's budgeted. Well, there's not going to be any carry forward funds resulting in that situation because vacancy savings is budget budgeted as a reduction to the budgeted amount. So, I don't think uh, the budgeting of vacancy savings is resulting in carry forward. In fact, it's exactly the converse. If your actual vacancies are higher than what you've budgeted as vacancy savings that's what results in a surplus funds to carry forward, if that makes sense. Okay. Typically, it's a right around 4% is about the normal churn in vacancy savings. So like if you're running a department, you might, you might want to be able to think usually 2%, you could probably build in your budget, but 10%, and this is really particularly high. I will also confirm that we, we have been reasonably, uh, we, in fact, we've been more than reasonable. We've been very uh, aware of vacancies and we've asked departments to budget for what they actually anticipate vacancies to be. Because it, it does us no good for them to budget for a 3% vacancy rate and then have a 10% vacancy rate. I mean, yes, that results in carry forward, but you know, we want them to run their departments. So we've actually, you'll see, and when we present our budget, you know, in a couple of weeks too, that we've looked at what actual vacancy rates are today. And admittedly, this budget will be for six months from now and up to eight. So we've asked for some prediction, but uh, we also don't buy the idea that you have a 12% vacancy rate today and suddenly at budget time, you know, in July 1, you can have a 3% vacancy rate. That just typically doesn't happen. So we've tried to be very accurate, actually, with the amount of vacancies uh, that departments budget for. But above and beyond that, I mean, it's, you know, we have a lot more vacancies than we anticipate. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, and most departments are not holding back to hire. Most departments can hire. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that many of our largest vacancies in corrections, state police, they're on bended knee. Um, they're on bended knee. They're not holding anything back. So anyway. I hear so said enough. one of the reasons why I've been working as a substitute teacher. <laughs> not in corrections. <laughs> I've got Representative Holcomb and then Representative D Dick Insen. One question and one comment. Um, with respect to, has the state evaluated the classification systems to look at whether state positions are actually competitive? I mean, I know in the education sector, for example, you can get paid thirty thousand dollars more per year in school systems than you can in state government for comparable responsibilities. And I just wonder if the state's going to have to look at the staffing structure for the state and the compensation for state in certain professional categories. And then the uh, second question was with respect to some of these counterintuitive surpluses. I'm looking at the homeowner rebates and the renter rebates and the food bank. What if people could come prepared to talk about the context? I mean, the first question this raises to me is what's happening with three squares per month and what's the implications of that for drawing down federal funds to support school meals, for example. A lot of these things are connected to other funding streams. And if people could come 
prepared to talk about that. I think that would be really helpful in making sense of these as indicators of what's going on in the state right now. Sure. Helpful. Thank you. In brief answer to your first point, though, um, you know, we're beholden to a collective bargaining agreement, as you're well aware. Um, and so we pay our employees according to the agreement. Uh, and if um, state employees believe that they are undercompensated or underbenefited, they come to the table and they ask us. Um, so we have, but whereas that's a good thing, it's also a, a kind of a bit of a straitjacket. Um, you know, we don't have the, the flexibility that a private entity might. Um, you'll note in here, where we have found some flexibility is in, you'll note, side agreements. For example, we mentioned that in uh, corrections. Um, state troopers, there was a, a, an agreement that we locked in after the budget went to press that's currently featured here. Um, you know, mental health. Um, so we're doing what we can within the agreements that we have, but. Um, Sometimes there's a review through HR, right? There'll yes. be a whole class. That's correct. Food. And I remember a few years ago, there was large, we were like anticipating that this, that the number of classes that were gonna be reviewed will have an impact. We just didn't know how much. And it, we could see that kind of wave coming. And that's- We also have to be careful though, that reclassifications are not for giving raises. Right, no, they are not. There has to be a reason to reclassify a position. Right. That has not, you know, reclassification has nothing to do with money, it has everything to do with your job responsibilities. If you're asked yeah. to do A, B, C, and most of your job is A, B, C, and D, then you can reclassify to include D. But you can't just reclassify positions to give out raises. And, you know, that's. That's, that's yeah, the system. I, yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't talking about the, I was talking about Wilson's and the classification system and the reality that being an analyst today is not the same as it was 20 years ago, simply because of the technological tools. And that's just, I think it just changed how we work. So I, I hear you and I know it's a tough issue, but right. you need to think about that. Yeah. I think I've got Representative Dickinson and then Representative Harrison. Yeah, if I hear you correctly, the vacancies are related to workforce, lack of workforce, not just you guys, it's everybody. Is that correct? It's everybody. I mean, you'll, you'll see, in initiatives that we present in a couple of weeks, not to get ahead of myself, but we're suffering as many other states and industry is suffering. We just don't have enough workers. So that's reflected in our vacancy. You good? Mm -hmm. Harrison? I don't remember. Yeah, just a point of information. Begin the process of human resources to mm -hmm. do the reclassification. Um, it's it's not a short process and it's been 40 years done so um, thank you okay so you see uh further down the page there are reversions uh to the ed fund from various programs that had extra that stays you know in the ed fund and cycled back into um operations the following year um, of note, I, I, I would comment on the from uh, the special education formula debt ID, well, a large amount of $27.3 million, still $30 million of carry forward uh, left debt ID, um, specifically for the purpose of mitigating the impact of one time, uh, the one time tail payment. It's anticipated with the shift from the reimbursement uh, model to the census grant model. And this is um, uh, this is also tied to a question that was asked by the committee during our presentation on Friday uh, about uh, why the uh, special ed was not seen on the worksheet page of the of the PAA. And that's because it's being handled via retention of this carry forward amount of Thirty million dollars, which you don't see here, but that's that's uh, being left uh, in place, and there's still the twenty-seven available for reversion, according to the uh, numbers we've gotten from AOE. So, so if I was to think about this in the terms that there was fifty-seven there, twenty-seven coming back and leaving thirty. So. 
That's correct. If there are no other questions or comments on the reversion section, I'll move on. Uh, the next section is an amendment of D102A, which is the section that pertains to the 2753 reserve. And this is a purely uh, technical correction. The uh, fiscal reference to fiscal year was made in the, uh, in the bill. So we're correcting that from to refer to 2023 and not to 2023. Um, the, the next section is also uh, what I would consider uh, changes that are technical corrections in nature. The section E100 is typically utilized in the big bill for creation of new positions. Um, there were positions that were uh, well intended to be created by other bills other than the big bill. Um, however, they did not include the actual proper language actually making that position creation take place. So things were uh, defined like th what the job duties of the position would be, but there was not actual position creation language, which follows a pretty specific format. Um, you, uh, you need to define whether it's um, permanent or limited service, and you need to define whether it's classified uh, or exempt, basically. So there are those different combinations available. So this is clarifying that uh, the, the newly created Office of Child, Youth, and Family Advocate is um, having two, uh, two positions created and that those are, in fact, permanent um, exempt positions in this case. And, and so this provides the positions intended by uh, Act 129. And then subsection G creates three commissioner positions, uh, which uh, were the intended to be created by Act 128 uh, for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. However, again, that very specific language creating them and specifying the nature of the positions wasn't present. So that's what's happening here. Okay. Oh, did you have your hand up? No. In the uh, next section um, brings back up uh, the rural infrastructure assistance program. You saw the appropriation made earlier in uh, this sheet, and this provides uh, some description of the program. Uh, I am aware that you, I believe, have invited the administration in to speak to you. I think they'll be able to provide in greater detail. Um, but, you know, suffice it to say that this is a program to help smaller or rural communities uh, access many of the uh, ARPA funds and granting opportunities available to them. Um, it includes uh, kind of a measure of how we will define which communities can apply uh, for these funds. And also it includes uh, various uh, support services that will be made available to eligible communities. More than a few hands went up. Representative Torino. So uh, thank you. I'm trying to use my weak memory to remember. But uh, so there's something interesting here that I guess I will hear when we hear back from the administration more details. Vermont League of Cities and Towns asked us for money to do something very similar. I thought we funded it. Um, RPCs are doing this in their day-to-day -day work. Uh, we did a little bit to help them last year, but I mean, mm -hmm. independent of whether they're funded correctly or not, this is their day-to-day -day work. Uh, why, why within the agency administration, and it also doesn't, I mean, it looks like it sort of contemplates its own demise with the funds not being available because it's one-time dollars, but it's, it's, it also reads as something that could become an ongoing program. And so I'm just, I'm just curious, all the, the intersection of all of those things. Right. So the agency may well decide to work with Vaughn League of Cities and Towns or local RDCs or RPCs. <laughs> so there's nothing in here that says they can't. 
Um, but I think they are going to stand up the program so that the resources go to the communities. They try to limit the administrative expenses that are taken out. Um, and they try to be thoughtful about which communities are accessed. Um, the fact is, if this work were going on already, we wouldn't need to do this. But our worry is that as the clock ticks, time is moving and we don't see the amount of support or the amount of money going to rural communities as we'd like. To. Um, no, it's not a fair race in many ways. I mean, some communities have a bandwidth, others are very small and don't. But there's nothing that precludes the agency from reaching out to these organizations and working with them to do it. I think they would be the better place to come in and tell you how to I've got, I've got Representative Harrison, Representative Page, and then I'm Representative Dole. Okay. And okay. Shy. And Shy. Representative Page, you were next. Yes. Um, as I look at this list here, maybe you could apply it to, other than the example I'm going to use, I see broadband development. Um, the, the, Communication union districts are already getting funding. So why include it here in administrative support for the local communities? So there is um, a fair amount of broadband money, ARPA money, roughly a quarter of a billion dollars. Um, add another 100 million from ARPA capital funds. Um, and those are dominantly granted so we want to make sure that these communities are in line for that. Um, and it's true that the CUDs are their kind of representative organizations, uh, but they there may be different levels of participation among the CUDs, different amount of bandwidth. We don't know that. We just want to make sure, you know, at the end of the day, ensuring that the, level, the playing field is level is a good thing. If we find that it is level, then there's no need for this money and it can revert back to the bottom line of ARPA. Um, but I suspect the more we look, the more we'll see that there are differential um, resources um, in different parts of the state that need to be addressed. So the resources to access it. So if you, That's you're getting a letter in the mail that said, if you apply for this, you can get this. And they go, I don't know how to apply to that. And I don't have anybody. And there was nobody to even open the mail. So we want to make sure that they get. That's what I'm. If I'm if I'm reading the intent. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I think we're down, Representative uh, uh, Dolan and then Representative Shai. I, I appreciate this focus on especially the smaller, perhaps under, underserved communities. I worry a bit that the, as I understand, I checked in with Joint Fiscal that the ARPA funds have been fully allocated. Mm -hmm. And so what we're talking about here is perhaps access to our traditional funds that we make available or perhaps other federal funding, such as the Inflation Reduction Act or the Infrastructure Act that provides uh, obviously additional uh, funding for the use of similar purposes. But I, I do worry that we've already perhaps allocated ARPA funds. Do you anticipate that, uh, and, and that's 100% grant related funding? So some of those funds were allocated to granting programs through ACCD, through ANR and the like that we need that um, local communities will apply for. Um, as well, uh, there is other uh, IIJA money that is coming down the pike. So. ARPA money has been appropriated, but not all of it's been used. In many cases, we've appropriated, say, $50 million to ACCD, to stand up, you know, ABC program. And then um, organizations or communities will apply for that. So that money hasn't been spent. It hasn't been obligated. It's appropriated, but not obligated. So that's available. We're hoping the communities will put their name, throw their name in the hat for that. Uh, as well, as you mentioned, there is more money coming down the pike um, that I think uh, these communities should be part of. That's all. So it's not really, 
of the granting programs out there, and I don't have a number in front of me that tells me of the one billion that we've appropriated, how much is actually going to be granted out, but it's fairly substantial, fairly substantial. So that's the money that we're thinking about, as well as additional programs like IIJA. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Are you good? good. Representative Shai and then Representative Page. Thank you. Um, I had similar questions to Rep Tolino, uh, but in addition, I'm curious as to how developed this program is now and what this Vermont underserved community index is and who uh, is developing that and what expertise they have to do so. So, uh, and thank you for the question. So, uh, that is being developed by the Agency of Administration. I suspect with the assistance of, of Guidehouse, our consultant, but I will make, I will yield to them to uh, answer that question. For those of you that don't know or are not familiar with the term Guidehouse or what that means, it's it's the entity that the state of Vermont has, uh, has been working with or hired to help to be a consultant to make sure that we don't step out of bounds with the use of any of these federal dollars that are grants. So they have sort of the expertise in advising a state. Um, when we say, hey, we think we wanna be able to uh, use all our ARPA dollars to buy clementines. And they go, that's probably not gonna fly. <laughs> so we use them as, our, as, um, as, a, as a helpful piece uh, of our business. Does that make sense? I just wanted you to know who Guy House was. So just to go back to my first question, um, has this program been developed at all by the AOA other than the language that's in here? And when do they expect to go live? Uh, the program is being developed. It has not been developed yet. It's being developed. Um, and we hope to bring it live as I would say ASAP, but I don't have a timeline for you. I will uh, I'll get you one. Thank you. You good? Think you're good? Yep. Representative Page. Um, yes, uh, just a comment. Um, I think this is a great idea for some communities, okay, that really don't have the wherewithal to, you know, write grants and things like that. But it also strikes me as, oh, there may be state agencies that are already or, sh already or should be doing some of this work to help their communities, like development development agencies. Um, would I be off the mark by saying that? Probably the single most important agency in that regard would be the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Um, and they work with local development agencies like, you know, the um, RDCs and RPCs um, and the like, but that typically is the extent of their direct involvement with local communities. It just seems like a duplication of effort in some cases. It's just. <clears throat> I case. think it would be much welcomed by communities who um, need additional <clears throat> ACC. I can assure you, if we had that bandwidth, we would be doing it now. Um, so, thank you. You're welcome. I think we're caught up. So it's a quarter of twelve, and we're going to go to lunch at around that. We're on page seven. So if I was to like reach into my hopeful hat, it'd be great if we got to ten because it's almost about halfway through. So I've uh, asked our uh, our committee assistant to take a look at our schedule because obviously we're going to need you back for the other half and uh, commissioner so before if when we go here at noon if you could check in to see what your schedule would allow as well but, okay, okay thank you I, I think we can there are a few of these that I think we can go through relatively quickly because they're either just of what we've already said or otherwise but we'll uh, so sure um, Moving to the next section, which amends uh, Act 185, Section E.105.2. Uh, this is purely 
creating uh, alignment of technical language with the changes uh, regarding the technology modernization special fund appropriations that have already been discussed in a couple previous sections. I think we could probably um, jump past this if we'd like to keep moving. There's no there's no new news here. This is just making the legal language comport with the uh, financial transactions. So uh, the next section being um, an amendment of Act 185, Section E.233.2A. Um, we this is the language that follows up on um, discussion we had on Friday, which is concerning the um, aligning the actual appropriation to the Vermont Community Broadband Board with the budget that they were required to develop for uh, for this purpose of making these adjustments in the fiscal year 23 BAA. So originally you can see in this language, uh, $1.5 million special fund appropriation was made to fund the VCBB in 23 with the expectation this would be adjusted based on an actual budget being created and presented. So we're decreasing that $1.5 million appropriation slightly to 1.435 and then we're adding another $684,000 from federal funds to operate the board. And uh, we're now crossing out the second sentence in that section because this has already been done. So next section. Screw up of what's happening. Yeah. Um, do you want to pick On up the, the next? Um, and then at the bottom, very bottom of page nine, we go back to the um, uh, uh, employment supports for new Americans. We spoke about this program earlier. Um, and uh, you know, I think uh, we spoke about it when we went through the appropriation for this program. This is the language that describes what exactly we intend to do. Um, I think the state refugee office, notably uh, Tracy Grilling, would be very happy to come in and speak to you more, more details about the program um, as such, but it's a $350,000 appropriation. Uh, to stand up a new program to uh, help communities assess the ability to support resettlement and help organizations that provide services to these organizations. Um, I think, if, you know, moving on to that, there are a number of um, what I would call technical adjustments right. to appropriations within human services really more true ups to what we think will be the actual number as opposed to a forecasted number. Uh, at the very top of page 11. Um, we're truing up a global commitment amount. And the same is true um, underneath where we're um, just providing what are more accurate numbers to what we knew when we did budgeting. <laughs> I know it's, we're all getting a little little bit hungry and um, and our voices get a little weaker, but I know you're so far away, Commissioner, but I can't. <laughs> I think you might. I'm holding up okay. You're doing all right. We're, we're happy to. You know. A little out, yeah. Representative Holcomb, go ahead. I second that. You're, you're doing an amazing job. I, the, my question on global commitment, I think, is something we may get answered later, but when we get this adjustment, does that also affect the Medicaid, the match? Uh, yes. Yes, it does. So what's the opportunity cost of reducing this investment here? So when we're changing the amount of, of global commitment, you can think about it you know, as changing the amount of state match, state general fund, as well as federal funds that we anticipate coming in. So there'll be a reduction in global commitment amounts. We'll, you'll see a corresponding in B301, generally a reduction in general fund. So what's, match requirement. so what's the opportunity cost? What are we not doing? by not pulling down those. So these adjustments typically are truing up to what our current utilization and caseload amounts are. Okay. That's all, we're, we're, we're not, this is not a, a policy move. This is more of a truing up to what actuals are relative to <laughs> what we estimated, that's all. So th th there's, there's no policy involved. In this. this is just associated with case utilization. We have more current information. We're halfway through the year and we were pretty, now, 
more knowledgeable anyway. There'll be actually, a tr again, a true up at kind of at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there will be with respect to general medical education. Likely. And this is 301, which is the mixing bowl. So that's correct. where like a lot goes in. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Uh, um, the chair is okay. We can move on to uh, the following section, which are um, the increasing reimbursement rates for so-called PNMI, private non-medical institutions. Um, the uh, agency uh, has asked to um, kind of uh, provide rate increases or PNMI, these are providers uh, for both. Hey, with the PMI, this is the per member per month, is that, or what's, just so people listening and that new people here, we make sure we're on the same page. They're private non-medical private. There we go. It's like when I these are providers to the state um, and they, like many of our providers, uh, have been under severe pressure to yeah. maintain staffing levels um, and to provide um, essentially staff their, their beds and staff their organizations. And so um, this is acknowledging that in FY23, uh, their rates, what, what they're trying to do is lift their rates and backdate it from the beginning of 23 through June 30th of this year. So it's one year of increased uh, rates to providers. I see this twice, once for the Department of Mental Health and once for DCF. So, so these are gross amounts. Um, the general fund amount uh, is less than that. So in section E314.3, you see $420,000. If you look back at the spreadsheets we spoke about, uh, or we distributed on Friday, about $4748,000 of general fund and the remaining amount would be global country. Similarly, for uh, DCF in E317.1, the total appropriation is 1.9, um, and that's $200,000 of general fund and about 1.7 of global commitment. So the total amount, the gross amount going to um, increasing uh, provider rates at PNMI is about $2.3 million for FY23. And you can anticipate that when we present a budget in FY24, that these rates will be. I look at it too. I see the B314, which is mental health on the first one. So just because we're all in a learning phase and somebody's tuning in, can you give me an example to help us dial in for people who may not know what is an example of a non medical um, institution? So, and I don't want to the spot, sir. No, no, that's all right. And actually, it, it would probably be better to ask the folks at DMH and DCF, but you know, these are providers that are taking, I think it's predominantly the DC. children and that are being you know, uh, provided for there um, for various support services, predominantly children. Okay. Representative Dick Dickinson. I have a you have a hand up here. Oh, represent. Thank you, Representative Shai. Go ahead. Thank you. You asked my first question. My second question, which may also be for others, is: Do we know how many PNMIs there are in the state? I will um, gladly punt on that answer, and <laughs> I think it's a much better topic to take up with the folks. In Let's go to that level. Yeah. Okay. I really, I bring that question up because sometimes I have been around it for a while, but and, but then I can still be off by a curb or something. Often I'm in the right church, wrong pew. I'm getting a, <laughs> a dozen, am I? 12. Well, okay. That's what I'm hearing, but. <laughs> get you a little uh, helpful earpiece. I have someone who's smarter than I am sitting behind me, so. Sometimes that helps. If you guys ask the right questions and you have support, I can. Exactly. 
All right, I've got one minute to 12. And is that a good spot to stop? Because we go into 500 then. That ends the human right. You've got a, the next starts in education. I'll, I'll leave, Commissioner, are you? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Potter, you can tell me if it's not. I, that's as, as good a place as any of us. Okay. All right. So we're at the bottom of page 12. <clears throat> And uh, we'll work, we're going to work you in to get the rest of this presentation. Sounds good. Thank you for your patience. No. Yes. Thank you. So, um, sorry, I was going to say, okay, class. <laughs> I've been. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Fifth and sixth graders are kind of fun. I don't know if it's, um, it's noon, so we're, we've got, a, according to our agenda, we're off for lunch until one, and at one o'clock, we're going to hear a walkthrough on the letter of intent that you've heard them mention that was left off at the end. And then we'll have a break, and then we will we have a lot of scheduled um, more orientations. <coughs> All right. Anybody need anything from the supply room that I could go down and make sure that even in our sort of evolving space, make your life comfortable pencils pens chalk add stuff manila and manila folders manila folders that was yep. oh i think we could goodbye live stream we'll see you in an hour thank <laughs> you